Merci, Maurice. Thank you, uh, thank you for the, uh, to the uh, CES for, uh, for inviting me to speak today. I want to thank my two predecessors for a uh, for good presentation. I think I'll, uh, I'll put a bit of a different spin, as you may imagine, on, on the whole thing. And uh, I'm not going to give a lecture on uh, supply management, but I want to... I wanna, you see the title I put on the sidelines of the big league, and I hope at the end of my presentation you'll understand why I've been, uh, why I entitled that that way. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, talk, situate Canada a little bit in the uh, in uh, in the world. I think it's been uh, it's been done with the U.S. with the EU. So uh, where do we fit in this global picture? What lessons have we learned from uh, previous reforms and, and change? Because we hear a lot about reforms and how our system needs to be uh, perhaps reformed. And what we're doing uh, currently and what we could be doing in the future possibly to help, uh, to help uh, with our system. So in terms of production, uh, I borrowed a lot of the, uh, the graph from uh, the International Dairy Federation, which I'm involved with. Um, you can see the growth uh, annually uh, worldwide is around 2.5% um, on all species and uh, cow a little uh, lower, but the overall milk production in the world uh, stand at about 770 million tons at this point. 83% comes from cow. In terms of consumption, uh, we stand at about 109 kilos per capita worldwide, and there's very big differences between, uh, between countries. If you look in the uh, EU, that's about 288 kilograms. If you look in uh, North America, Canada, US is similar, uh, at about 275 or so. So quite a bit higher, and when you look at uh, some of the countries like China, it's more like uh, 35 kilos per capita. So there's, there's a lot of room there. Um, where is the growth in, in consumption? Um, three main areas, uh, South America, Asia, and, uh, and Africa. And if you look at Asia, for example, and I, I circle uh, 22% uh, uh, growth in the last, uh, in the last year, uh, with an average uh, just a little over 60 kilograms per capita. But you see China with, uh, with a lot of room there. And I think the important thing is that when you look at these three regions, they represent a little over 80% of the world population. So we may talk about US and, and definitely not Canada and population, but uh, US and EU, but they, uh, they, these countries represent quite a bit. And a uh, little anecdote I was reading in the press, I think yesterday, last night, or this morning, uh, that uh, China has uh, now uh, highest red wine consumption than, than France overall. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen that, so that tells us maybe that there's hope for milk. Um, when we look at the, uh, and, and my predecessor, have, uh, my, my colleagues here, have talked a little bit about that. This is uh, showing the, uh, the sales, the turnover of the largest 25 dairies in the world in the last year. And uh, I put a, a light blue eye line on uh, our three major processors, three of the major processors that are involved in, in Canada. Um, Parmalat, which is now part of the group Lactalis uh, out of France. Uh, they're number one in terms of dairy. Uh, Saputo 11 and Agripur 22. And when we look at these three uh, players on the Canadian, uh, in the Canadian industry, uh, when we think about you know, concentration in the retail and so on, I haven't looked at that recently, but definitely in the processing sector, we're looking at uh, anywhere between 75 and 80% of the milk that's taken by those three players. In terms of the trade, um, you can see that it's growing, but on average, uh, uh, trade of dairy product is not, is not a significant part of production. Over the last decade, we've been running anywhere between, uh, it's grown from about six to 8%. 
And um, when we look at the, uh, the top destination for dairy product, uh, in the last year, more than half of the growth has been taken by China, Russia, and Mexico. So only three countries. Um, you look at the largest exporters, um, um, <clears throat> New Zealand being the top, EU, and then followed by US, and uh, that graph a few years ago would have been, uh, would have been very different. Um, the important here, I think, is I want to outline the fact that EU and US together represent about 38% of, uh, of the trade. And it just happened to be about their, the size, the relative size of their production worldwide as well. If you look at the, uh, so you look at the top exporter, uh, the growth, uh, you can see the growth on the right in New Zealand and USA. It's been, uh, it's been uh, mentioned before. And uh, the top three uh, region uh, represent uh, about 75% of the growth in, uh, in export. When we look at the Canadian picture, it's quite a different uh, story, as you know. I don't think there's any surprises there. Um, pretty much a steady decline in the trade balance. And, uh, of course, that's a combination of, uh, of uh, reduced exports, partly because uh, we've lost a panel uh, about uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, so we're very limited in the way we export by running the supply management system. Um, and uh, we're limited to our subsidized exports, which is a relatively small uh, part of our, uh, of our overall production, and we import more and more product. Um, size of Canada, I think that's to put things in perspective, that's cow's milk, cow milk production. We represent about 1.4% of cow's milk and a little over 1% of total milk production. Um, when you look at these, uh, this pie chart, uh, you look at the darker blue there are U.S. And, and EU, and it just happened that it's about 38% of the world cow's milk production as well. So roughly the same proportion of, of export versus, uh, versus production. You look at Oceania being uh, a clearly a net exporter uh, with only about 5% of the production, but 35% uh, of export and uh, Asia and the rest, of course, being, uh, being net importers. I did a few uh, stats looking at uh, different regions, and uh, I look at the last, uh, last decade, uh, the number of farms. I think it's been touched on in previous presentation. Um, the point here is that the decline in number of farms when you compare Canada, U.S., and I pick two European countries that are quite prevalent, France and, and Germany, the decline in the number of farms is, is very similar. So uh, the level of consolidation at the farm level is about the same. In Canada, we stand just a little over 12,000 uh, dairy farms. Um, when supply management was introduced, uh, we were a little over more than uh, tenfold that, that number. So it declined more than 90% uh, since then. And uh, since I joined the commission, the number of farms uh, has gone uh, as is only half of it was in the uh, mid to late uh, 90s. Prices, no surprise uh, that uh, Canadian prices uh, is uh, among some of the highest, but there, there are definitely higher uh, prices out there. Um, you might say they're not major uh, producing country. Canada is not either. Um, and a lot of those countries are, are either net importers or uh, focus on, on, their, uh, on their domestic market. Um, what this doesn't account is all the subsidies that are paid. Uh, and that's the big difference, you know, the government payments, the taxpayer dollars that goes into, uh, into uh, helping the dairy farmers where there's definitely none of that in Canada. A lot of those other countries have, uh, have a share uh, over and above that. Here, this is a slide, uh, of course, uh, showing the uh, the uh, stability and predictability and, and increase. And uh, the red line is the Canadian uh, 
uh, target price, which is basically a combination of our uh, support price for uh, butter and skim milk powder. And you can see that it's been, uh, it's been steadily growing over the last, uh, this is a 15 year period where uh, when you look at the US and here we use a class three, class four price, but if you would use all milk, it would be uh, similar, perhaps a little higher because you would have the effect of fluid, but this is comparing industrial uh, milk price. Um, and essentially, this is in nominal terms. So if you would like look at that in real terms, which I usually don't, uh, the red line would probably still show uh, a slight in some increase, probably not as uh, steep as it is, but definitely the trend line uh, in the U.S. during that period, uh, you have a flat or downward trend uh, right now uh, in nominal terms, so in real terms, it would definitely be a, a downward trend. A few words on uh, producer, producer share of the consumer dollar. Um, this is a, a study done by the uh, International Farm uh, Cost Comparison out of uh, Germany. And uh, this is the, the last one I could get. And uh, uh, they had found that in 2011, about 46% of the producer, uh, of the consumer dollar was captured by, uh, by their farmers in, in, uh, in the US. Um, in Canada, it was higher than that, of course. Uh, but I have numbers average that I obtained from uh, studies of uh, the decade between 2000 and 2010. And uh, in France, it varied between uh, 29 and 36. Germany, very similar, 25 to 35 percent. Uh, U.S., uh, a little higher, between uh, 30 and 45. And in Canada, anywhere between uh, 58 and 78 percent. So. Definitely the message here is that um, system that we have allowed the producer to capture a much higher share of the consumer dollar. I did a bit of comparison on fluid milk and uh, using some of the extreme, but uh, I use a, uh, a basically a, a loss leader uh, type of uh, product, which is a, a four liter at uh, mass merchandiser. And I found out that when I look at the components, the producer gets about 83% of the uh, of the um, of the uh, retail price of that of that fluid milk, I use the uh, regulated price in Quebec for the same uh, four liters, and I found out that it's about it's about 55 percent. Um, when you look at retail prices, um, there's certainly, and I think it's been mentioned before, there's certainly a big disconnect between uh, what I found out over the years in many areas of the world between what the producer gets and what the consumer pays. Um, we look at our, our prices in Canada, of course, comparison uh, just south of the border on the, uh, on the border line there. Uh, a lot of those comparisons are made there, but when you look at uh, the, the real price in the U.S. in many areas, it is different. It's probably somewhat lower than Canada, but the difference are not that big. If you go to New Zealand, I would challenge you to find dairy products uh, on the shelf uh, cheaper than in Canada in many stores. When you look at, uh, I just took a uh, look at uh, cheddar, which is a commodity, uh, essentially uh, a product, but uh, looking at Canada, US. So again, you see the, uh, of course, Canada is higher. Uh, but not as much as uh, some would have expected in terms of, uh, in terms of retail prices. And uh, the, uh, the volatility is, of course, a a quite a bit less, uh, less in Canada. Um, we look at probably anywhere between 12 to 15 percent swings in Canada. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, with the big uh, swing in the U.S. there in uh, 08 or 09, um, about 40 percent. So I'll switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about uh, so what can we learn? Uh, um, I'm not sure we can learn a whole lot uh, because of our system, because of the way it's been ran and so on over the years. Um, we have looked we have looked at the, the experience and of reforms in, in other part of the uh, of the world. And uh, I guess the question you have to ask yourself, uh, 
Are dairy farmers really better off in the end? Are consumers really benefiting from, uh, from these reforms? I think it's, uh, it's questionable in, in, in certain areas of the world. Um, have they realized the market growth? I think that's probably where the, the, that's one of the elements where the, you have seen the more, uh, the more impact. Um, I've looked at, uh, again, last decade and look at uh, U.S. milk production, and I found out that it grew at about an average of about 1.8 percent. Uh, New Zealand at about an average of 3.7 percent a year, while we've barely made, uh, been able to maintain population growth in Canada at uh, less than 1 percent. So I think that's something to think about. Um, looking at the future, Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at the future, um, dairy production is is growing, as I mentioned, at about two and a half percent a year. Uh, consumption is growing at a very similar rate. What the future is going to bring is very interesting. I think the difficulty on the world market, and Mark talked about uh, about the U.S. being the the balancing wheel and. I don't think that's the term you use, but sometimes that's, that, that's how it's perceived. Um, I think with, with low inventories, um, the fact that we have a perishable product and, uh, and uh, a product that's very susceptible to, uh, to high price fluctuation. So the supply response, uh, maybe in the U.S. it's better, but it's not always, uh, it's not always as good as expected. And uh, you have, of course, with that, you have weather condition and so on. Uh, the trend in the world is less, less government dollars to support uh, um, dairy production. Uh, this is pretty much uh, around the world. Um, I guess I'll skip that. We talked quite a bit about the farm bill, the end of the quota, and so on. Uh, I think one of the issues where Canada, when we're in the place Canada is probably well positioned is in terms of the land base, perhaps less environmental issues in the uh, in the future and so on, and uh, that may help to grow, uh, to grow our industry. Um, some other observation, um, there's, there's still quite a bit of budget expenditure around the world in the dairy sector. Uh, uh, EU, at, you know, some of the numbers I picked, three and a half billion dollar, uh, billion euros in a period of time. Uh, US, uh, 40 billion over a 40 uh, over a 10-year period, uh, so that's uh, that's quite significant. That's uh, our Canadian producer don't definitely don't get that, and we are convinced that these subsidies contribute to uh, probably more depressed uh, world prices. So if they if they go or they reduce, uh, I think uh, that should help to strengthen the price. Um, two words about CETA. Uh, I think. Uh, Short run, yes, I think it was mentioned, the impact of the cheese. Long run, I think Canada could have opportunities, uh, could have opportunities that they could tap into that market. Uh, TPP and uh, TTIP, uh, US, Europe, we'll have to see what that brings. Um, we'll see how, how long it takes to get uh, agreements to those. So I'll close by talking a bit about how we're adjusting to uh, to uh, some of the, those changes, not exactly related to the world market, but what we're doing within the supply management system. I think the system has been great and probably will con be continuing to be great to bring stability and predictability. Our government are not prepared to pump huge dollars like some of the other uh, government are still uh, putting in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in their dairy sector or other, other sectors. Uh, I think the core element of, uh, of our system will continue, uh, i.e. trying to keep a, a relative good balance between the supply and the demand, producer price that reflects the uh, cost of production, and uh, border control. Border control is uh, probably an issue. That's probably where some of the concerns are, uh, definitely from the producer side of things. And, uh, and uh, the borders are getting uh, more and more porous, so it's important uh, to, to make sure that... Uh, and from our, my perspective, uh, being an administrator of, the, of, the, of that system, it becomes uh, increasingly hard to manage the supply management system when you don't know exactly what's going on and what to expect. Um, 
this is the last slide. Um, so what are we doing? We try to, I think the objective is to try to bring a little more growth than what we've seen in the past, uh, in the past decade. Um, we have introduced uh, through Milk Supply Management Committee a 1% growth allowance, uh, permanent growth allowance. And this is to be directed in priority to class two and three and f with a very specific focus on yogurt and fine cheese. So basically, it's like almost like having milk on demand, like fluid milk for the, not quite, but very close, in, certainly in, the, in certain part of the country. Uh, we're trying to put in place, the program has been in place, it's not been used, a skim milk redirection program. So rather than my commission buying surplus powder, we're trying to entice the processor to direct some of that skim mill towards better use in Canada. And, uh, and uh, hopefully that's going to work. We have, uh, we have put a new class 3D to encourage growth in the mozzarella market, and the, uh, especially for fresh pizza. Uh, I talk about the yogurt fine cheese. And I think the, uh, the, the, another very important part is to try to grow uh, the market for our own SNF, structural surplus, is, uh, has been growing. It's stabilized in the last year or two, but it's still very high. So we want to try to reduce that structural surplus. And hopefully, if we can bring more value to those products that we sell in animal feed or other, other low market, we can increase the return to producer without increasing the, uh, the price to, uh, to consumers. So, so I think overall, in the end, um, Canada is small overall. Um, we have a very different system that I think is going to continue for a while. The, uh, it seems that the political will is there to, uh, to continue with that system. It costs uh, almost nothing. And um, if the condition change in the long run, and i.e. less subsidies and, and, uh, and perhaps a world price that would stabilize, uh, it's nice to dream Canada may become a, a player in the world market. Thank you. Thank you.